The first staging of this play had to have been radical as fuck for it to get banned and for the writers to be jailed and forced to flee. There was something in that first staging that is absent in present day reenactments. Even though the words are the same, the play isn't the same. Hey, thanks for stopping by. If this is your first time here, Atel Lunacy is a pop culture podcast where we evaluate what African movies and TV shows show and tell us about society. The themes we commonly touch on are race, class, gender, and sexuality, all through a social justice lens. Today I want to talk about I Will Marry When I Want, which is a play that was written by two guys called Ngugi. Please don't judge me. Okay, can we just preface it by this? I watched this play in 2022 in may of 2022 and i am making a recording of it almost a year to the day almost a year after so uh friends this is what olympic level procrastination looks like and let's jump in on saturday 28th may 2022 I was fortunate to be able to go see Ngugi's play, I Will Marry When I Want, at the Kenya National Theatres. I was stoked to go see it. I read the book the week before and left the wedding early that day to make sure I got to the theatres on time. Let's talk about this play starring Nice Givenji and the usual amazing suspects and directed by Stuart Nash. This is the second Stuart Nash play I've seen, the first being Serafina, which also has a radical and revolutionary theme. I'll link to the Serafina review below, and we'll talk about it too as we investigate the limits of political theater. Serafina, for those who don't know, is one of the most beloved African musicals. It follows black South African students as they rise up and risk their lives resisting the oppression visited upon black people by the white apartheid government. I Will Marry When I Want, the play I'll mainly talk about, was written by two guys, both named Ngugi, and it was banned in Kenya. The play is set in post-colonial Kenya, and the main themes it covers touch on capitalism, class struggle, poverty, gender, religion, culture, race, politics, neocolonialism, and the fake independence Africans got after colonial struggles. The evening of the play opened with a brief introduction by Stuart Nash, the director, a white guy. And yes, it matters that he's white. First, white guy Nash talked about how the play was first staged in Lumuru 40 years ago, after which the dictatorial bitch Moy, my words not his, got pissed off and put Ngugi in prison for a year. When he was released, Ngugi Wadiongo ran off to the US, and his co-writer, the other Ngugi, escaped to Zimbabwe, never to be seen or heard from again. Then a recording of an old present-day Ngugi Wadiongo introducing the play from California was played. And to call it lackluster and anticlimactic would be to give it the highest praise. Thank you very, very much uh, for doing this. And I hope you enjoy performing it. And I hope your audience will equally enjoy your performance. Wow. I know. It's powerful. Very. It's important to note that nothing was said about the Adangugi, the curator who ran off to Zimbabwe. Not even in passing. One thing I was interested in is young versus old Ngugi. Young Ngugi being his younger self and old Ngugi being his old present day self. What was alarming was the fact that old present day Ngugi said nothing about the play and its revolutionary roots. All he said was something like, thanks for coming to watch it, how he's making this recording from California, and I don't remember what else. That's how basic, how bland it was. I literally asked my sister if she remembered anything else it said, and she was equally blank. All I could think about at that point was Yang Gugi. How did Yang, revolutionary, socialist Gugi, introduce the play that first time? There was no way it was that basic, that shallow, that empty, that impotent. I imagine it was electric. I imagine the crowd seated there, excited and fearful because they knew they were engaging in something subversive, something dangerous. Listening to old Ngugi talk reminded me how revolutions and radical thought are for the young. Not because old people can't do it, but because when you're young, you still have all this faith in what's possible, 
the conviction of your belief, hope, life and living hasn't killed it yet. I remember reading somewhere or hearing Angela Davis talk about how when she was younger, change felt so close, so near you could touch it. They were sure they were going to win and usher in socialism or communism. That's what being young is like. You fight and you have this faith, this conviction in the power of the people to effect change. I can't find the clip or text, so please share a link to it if you know where it's from. I once read a tweet by some middle-aged Nigerian guy, probably in his 40s, talking about when he was younger, he and his friends used to stay up all night talking about the change they wanted to see in Nigeria, the changes they wanted to be a part of ushering in. They were so excited, they'd find themselves talking about it for hours and hours late into the night. Now they're all older, most if not all of them are married with kids, they have jobs that keep them living relatively well. Now that same group, according to him, really talks about Nigeria and the changes they want. Now they talk about what schools to take their kids to and such. You live a little, get a cushy life, get old, and all that radical juice in you just gets diluted. Now you have stuff, you have things you're afraid of losing. You cannot take the risks you used to take earlier, the risks you would have taken as a younger person, who didn't really have a lot of stuff to protect. That trick reminded me that the time to be radical and engaged is when you're young. And Angela Davis reminds us that the way to remain like that, even as you grow older, is to stay engaged in social movements, stay in community with young radicals, or you just risk becoming a sad shell of your old revolutionary self. Most people say that you become more conservative the older you become and the richer you become. I'm not saying old and googie is not still engaged in social justice movements and communities. Just that I bet my last cent that young him would have never introduced the play like that. Another question that kept popping in my mind was why now? The first staging of this play had to have been radical as fuck for it to get banned and for the writers to be jailed and forced to flee. And it's not just that Moi was a dictatorial prick who couldn't stand dissent. There was something in that first staging that is absent in present day reenactments. Even though the words are the same, the play isn't the same. So what's the difference? Why can this band play be staged now without government interference? In fact, one could even say with tacit government approval. I mean, it was at the Kenyan National Theatres, not some small local community theatre. Plus, in the case of Serafina, the government sponsored some shows outside Nairobi. Yes, this government is not as dictatorial as Moe's, but it's still deplorable. And the truth is, if they felt threatened by it, even one iota, they would have banned it too. It's not that they are paragons of freedom who would never dream of banning free expression. The same spirit that lived in Moi lives in them all. The president at the time when this play was staged in 2022 was Moi Gai, who is one, the child of an imperialist collaborator and a sellout, rebranded as a freedom fighter, and two, a protege of Moi, the man who put the dick in dictator. The deputy president then and current president now, William Ruto, is arguably Moi's best student. The rest of them have roots that link back to Moi and other sellout ancestors. They were chiefs and district officers. They held electoral positions in his government or served him in different capacities from youth for Kanu to special branch investigators. Pretty much all of our elected rulers are implicated. So what is it? Why is it that this play can be staged now? when it was banned before. Even worse, how is it possible that they allowed it during an election year when it may be dangerous to suggest to people that the elite, all of them, are the problem? I don't know why now. I think one of the reasons is that the people who staged it then were revolutionary and radical and so that imbued the play with revolutionary potential, which was scary. Not to besmirch the good name of the cast, but the director is a white guy. A white guy in a play with strong themes about the deleterious effects of colonialism and western imperialism. How now? 
It's not impossible, but it takes a special kind of white guy. And still it's alright, but he don't fit the bill. I imagine it would have had a chance of working if the white man was one known to be radical and revolutionary. A socialist with a record of strong criticism against white supremacy in colonial Kenya and present-day Kenya. I ain't ever heard anything like that from or about Stuart Nash. In fact, I don't know that any white people enjoying the benefits of the highly stratified society that is Kenya ever complain about the benefits of white supremacy here. And what about the caste? Do we know any of their political leanings? Their critique, if any, of capitalism and its effects? Their championing of socialist policies, their allegiance to and support of the oppressed masses. Zero. We know none of this because it doesn't exist in the public domain. During his introduction, white man Stuart Nash announced that they would be staging one or two Kenyan or African plays every year. And that was revealing. For them, the director and the cast, I Will Marry When I Want, Serafina, and the rest are just fun, entertaining plays that they are staging. It has nothing to do with their political views or alignment. Even worse, after performing the plays, it probably has no effect on their pre-existing politics. It's just a play for them. There's no way it was just a play for the young googies and their cast. They understood the grave risk they were taking, the political implications of their actions, and they did it anyway. Because it was a product of the convictions of their beliefs. It was an act of resistance and agitation. It was political. It wasn't just a play for middle-class Kenyans to come and enjoy on a night out with friends. This is why one government banned the play and incarcerated the writers, while the other allowed it to be widely advertised and staged at the national theatres. One government knew the play's actors imbued it with revolutionary potential, and the other knows the present rendition is being staged purely for its entertainment value and nothing else. Let's talk about the target audience. I think the target audience was different then. I imagine that that first time, the play was staged before ordinary Wananji, the proletariat, people who could see themselves in the play. They were Kigunda having to rush to the neighbor to borrow salt because you have guests and you've run out and you can't afford to go and buy any. This time, it was staged for people who were largely not represented in the play. People with 1,300 advance or 1,600 at the gate to pay for a few hours of live entertainment. People who could afford to watch it almost as an academic exercise without being forced to see what their lives were like. The play's characters can be divided into two groups. The destitute group who are so poor as to wonder what they will eat. And the truly rich group, the kind who offhandedly count bundles of money at the dinner table. Folk who can loosely be classified as middle class who went to watch the play don't fall under any of the two groups for the most part. And so there's this distance for them. If you are a poor person watching that play, there's no distance. You are Kikunda and his wife. The play is funny when you read it. But I think the staged version tried too hard to be funny to the extent that instead of criticizing the excesses of the wealthy, it caricatured them, destroying any attempt at critiquing it so that it just became funny instead of infuriating, which in the book it is. It pisses you off. But the staged play doesn't do that. It just makes you shake your head and laugh, which, no. Also, these plays are so exclusionary, and if they had to make any kind of difference, they would have to not be. But that's assuming the producers want them to make any kind of difference. I, for example, would have never afforded to go see Serafina, or I will marry when I want, if I had to do it on my own dime. Shout out to Koei, who paid for Serafina, and Lois, who paid for I will marry when I want. One of the things that stood out for me was missing stuff. And I know that this is a common problem when it comes to adaptations, but yo, certain things from the book were missing, which disturbed me. For example, in the book, there's a scene where one of the rich men tells his fellow rich buddies that he has to live. 
He says his driver is waiting for him and the said driver has to drop him home and then walk back to his own place. This is the middle of the night and the rich man can drive himself, but he chooses not to. Instead, he makes his driver wait for him endlessly, knowing full well that after his driver drops him home, he'll have to walk back to his place. Why would you cut this part out? I bet there were people in that audience full of white people and like rich middle class Kenyans who do exactly what that rich man does to his driver. This is likely one of the only things the financially comfortable people in that audience could relate to and it was cut out. Why, Stuart? One other thing that bothered me. Okay, there were many things, but let's talk about this one too. Music. Mm. This part pissed me off. The musical performances were great, but hey, Stuart, when you translate a play and the music is translated to in the book, make sure your performance reflects that. The play as they performed it was in English. The music in Kikuyu. Make it make sense. Hmm? That's Kikuyu's supremacy and hegemony? Yeah, I said it. That's right, I said it. It had to be said. Somebody got to say it. Even if the music has to stay in Kikuyu, subtitle this shit, Stuart. The music is too critical a part of the play for you to just go like, whatever, man, they'll connect the dots. We didn't, Stuart. And you made the play a little less awesome with each subsequent untranslated Kikuyu number. There's a reason. The printed play translated the music to. You're not being smart, edgy, and authentic by ignoring that story. I remember I had this issue with Serafina as well. Dude, just subtitle shit. We'll still watch the spectacularly choreographed dances. We can multitask. This refusal to subtitle stuff just takes away from the experience. The people I was with at some point began talking during the singing bits, asking for translations and shit. Subtitles, Stewie. It's not that hard. Plus, the writers translated it. Where'd you get the idea that you were somehow too authentic for it? In conclusion, <laughs> I was really disillusioned when we were leaving our marriage when I went. I don't know what I expected, but it wasn't what I saw. People were just laughing and talking, and it didn't feel to me like people's minds were changed or like people were challenged to act or resist or organize. The play ends with a rousing call for the masses to organize, but it felt like it fell flat. Why? What makes a radical play a radical play? What makes a revolutionary play revolutionary? What makes it actually propel people to action? Are we just beyond that now? Are we the kind of people who can no longer be propagandized by the media to act? Is this why the government no longer has a problem with theater staging these kinds of previously dangerous political plays? And what does the future look like? if we cannot be reached and compelled to act through media. It was, it was fucking sad sitting there watching people go on like nothing had changed. Because nothing had. There's a part of me that feels like it would have been better for the play not to be staged at all than for something so powerful to be reduced to an entertaining evening for rich Kenyans and white people who were there. It was fucking sad. What makes a play revolutionary isn't just the words, but who does it? It's why white man Stuart Nash is allowed to stage Serafina and I will marry when I want. Plays with incredible revolutionary potential that cannot be realized through him. It's why the government went so far as to sponsor them when they staged Serafina. A socialist play only works is only powerful when performed and produced by people who are politically motivated to do so. I got to watch the play slash musical The Fall in Cape Town, documenting the student protests about access to free education for all. It was electric. I bought the book immediately. I continued to read it 
moved by my memory of the stage experience and the book itself. There's something different about a political propaganda play when it's made by people who are moved by the strength of their convictions. It's powerful in a way that's difficult to quantify or articulate. It just is. It has something, something almost magical. And that's what the Stuart Nash plays lack. There's a part of me that after watching I Will Marry When I Want, concluded that perhaps such political propaganda only works on people inclined to believe such things anyway. Sort of like Jesus and the parable of the seeds that fell or something like that. The ones that fell on fertile ground germinated and bore fruit, and the ones that fell on hard ground were just trampled on and died. Hoping this is an accurate recollection of that verse. The last time your girl cracked that Bible open was in 2015, so uh, I'm a little rusty. But the spirit of the verse remains. Maybe propaganda only works on people ready for it. And maybe nothing can be done to convert those who have dry soil, so to speak. Nothing except maybe waiting for them to become fertile. Or, I guess, fertilizing them with manure. Whatever that translates to in real life. Maybe it's not Stuart's fault. Oh, oh, come on. Some of it. Some of it is Stuart's fault. The core message of the play is it's not yet a whole. That we only moved from direct white oppressors to a combination of white oppressors and home guards masquerading as elected rulers in a representative democracy. That the working class and the capitalism produces everything and the predatory class holds all of the proceeds of their labor and oppresses them to boot. That the only way to change this and save ourselves and our children is to organize and overthrow them all and the system of capitalism. Do you think white man Stewart has said this in any of his interviews, much less thought it in private? I don't think so. That's me. If you've got thoughts about how to increase the effectiveness of such propaganda, how much you girl, I'd love to hear it. A part of me, a part of me still believes media works and it can change minds. But all these shows critical of society, capitalism and representative politics only serve to destroy whatever little faith I have. I mean, we have so many of them now. And they don't seem to push us or incite us to organize for change. That shit messes with my faith in the power of progressive media propaganda. Still, some faith remains. As they say, hope is the last to die. Until next time, remember who you are. Love life. Love people. Stay lunatic. Bye.